I found this idea utterly absurd. Then I thought of my grandparents, whom I knew only from their portraits. They looked benevolent and dignified enough to repulse any idea that they might possibly be to blame. I mentally ran through the long procession of unknown ancestors until finally I arrived at Adam and Eve. And with them came the decisive thought. Adam and Eve were the first people. They had no parents, but they were created directly by God, who intentionally made them as they were. They had no choice but to be exactly the way God had created them. Therefore, they did not know how they could possibly be different. They were perfect creatures of God, for He creates only perfection. And yet, they committed the first sin by doing what God did not want them to do. How was that possible? They could not have done it if God had not placed in them the possibility of doing it. Therefore, it was God's intention that they should sin. This thought liberated me instantly from my worst torment, since I now knew that God himself had placed me in this situation. At first, I did not know whether he intended me to commit my sin or not. What does God want, to act or not to act? I must find out what God wants with me, and I must find out right away. My broken sleep and my spiritual distress had worn me out to such a point that fending off the thought was tying me into unbearable knots. This could not go on. At the same time, I could not yield before I understood what God's will was and what he intended for I was now certain that he was the author of this desperate problem. I knew, beyond a doubt, that I would ultimately be compelled to break down, to give way. But I did not want it to happen without my understanding it, since the salvation of my eternal soul was at stake. God knows that I cannot resist much longer, and he does not help me, although I am on the point of having to commit the unforgivable sin. In his omnipotence, he could easily lift this compulsion from me, but evidently he is not going to. Can it be that he wishes to test my obedience by opposing on me the unusual task of doing something against my own moral judgment and against his own commandment, something I am resisting with all my strength because I fear eternal damnation? Is it possible that God wishes to see whether I am capable of obeying his will, even though my faith and my reason raise before me the specters of death and hell? That might really be the answer. Obviously, God also desires me to show courage, I thought. If that is so, and I go through with it, then he will give me his grace and illumination. I gathered all my courage, as though I were about to leap forthwith into hell fire and let the thought come. I saw before me the cathedral, the blue sky. God sits on his golden throne, high above the world, and under the throne an enormous turd falls upon the sparkling new roof, shatters it, and breaks the walls of the cathedral asunder. So that was it. I felt an enormous and indescribable relief. Instead of the expected damnation, grace had come upon me, and with it an unutterable bliss, such as I had never known. I wept for happiness and gratitude. The wisdom and goodness of God had been revealed to me now that I had yielded to his inexorable command. That was what my father had not understood, I thought. He had failed to experience the will of God, had opposed it for the best reasons and out of the deepest faith. And that is why he had never experienced the miracle of grace, which heals all and makes all comprehensible. He did not know the immediate living God who stands, omnipotent and free, above his Bible and his church, who calls upon man to partake of his freedom and can force him to renounce his own views and convictions in order to fulfill without reserve the command of God. In his trial of human courage, God refuses to abide by traditions, no matter how sacred. 
In his omnipotence, he will see to it that nothing really evil comes of such tests of courage. If one fulfills the will of God, one can be sure of going the right way. It was obedience which brought me grace, and after that experience, I knew what God's grace was. One must be utterly abandoned to God. Nothing matters but fulfilling His will. Otherwise, all is folly and meaninglessness. With the experience of God in the cathedral, I at last had something tangible that was part of the great secret. As if I had always talked of stones falling from heaven, and now had one in my pocket. But actually, it was a shaming experience. I had fallen into something bad, something evil and sinister, though at the same time, it was a kind of distinction. Sometimes I had an overwhelming urge to speak, not about that, but only to hint that there were some curious things about me which no one knew of. I wanted to find out whether other people had undergone similar experiences. I never succeeded in discovering so much as a trace of them in others. As a result, I had the feeling that I was either outlawed or elect, accursed or blessed. Student Years I looked forward with longing to the end of my school days. Then I would go to the university and study, natural science, of course. Then I would know something real. But no sooner had I made myself this promise than my doubts began. Was not my bent rather toward history and philosophy? Then again, I was intensely interested in everything Egyptian and Babylonian, and would have liked best to be an archaeologist. But I had no money to study anywhere except in Basel, and in Basel there was no teacher for this subject. So this plan very soon came to an end. For a long time I could not make up my mind, and constantly postponed the decision. My father was very worried. He said once, The boy is interested in everything imaginable, and he does not know what he wants. I could only admit that he was right. As matriculation approached, and we had to decide what faculty to register for, I abruptly decided on science. But I left my schoolfellows in doubt as to whether I intended to go in definitely for science or the humanities. This apparently sudden decision had a background of its own. Some weeks previously, I had two dreams. In the first dream, I was in a dark wood that stretched along the Rhine. I came to a little hill, a burial mound, and began to dig. After a while I turned up, to my astonishment, some bones of prehistoric animals. This interested me enormously, and at that moment I knew I must get to know nature, the world in which we live, and the things around us. Then came a second dream. Again I was in a wood. It was threaded with watercourses, and in the darkest place I saw a circular pool surrounded by dense undergrowth. Half immersed in the water lay the strangest and most wonderful creature, a round animal shimmering in opalescent hues and consisting of innumerable little cells or of organs shaped like tentacles. It was a giant radiolarian measuring about three feet across. It seemed to me indescribably wonderful that this magnificent creature should be lying there undisturbed, in the hidden place, in the clear, deep water. It aroused in me an intense desire for knowledge, so that I awoke with a beating heart. These two dreams decided me overwhelmingly in favor of science, and removed all my doubts. It became clear to me that I was living in a time and a place where a person had to earn his living. To do so, one had to be this or that, and it made a deep impression on me that all my schoolfellows were imbued with this necessity and thought about nothing else. I felt I was in some way odd. I saw I would have to settle down and think the matter through. If I took up zoology, for instance, 
I could be only a schoolmaster, or at best, an employee in a zoological garden. There was no future in that, even if one's demands were modest, though I would certainly have preferred working in a zoo to the life of a schoolteacher. In this blind alley, the inspiration suddenly came to me that I could study medicine. I told myself that the study of medicine, at least, began with scientific subjects. To that extent, I would be doing what I wanted. Moreover, the field of medicine was so broad that there was always the possibility of specializing later. I had definitely opted for science, and the only question was, how? I had to earn my living, and as I had no money, I could not attend a university abroad and obtain the kind of training that would give me hopes of a scientific career. At best, I could become only a dilettante in science. Nor, since I possessed a personality that made me disliked by many of my schoolfellows and of the people who counted, that is, the teachers, was there any hope of finding a patron who would support my wish. When, therefore, I finally decided on medicine, it was with the rather disagreeable feeling that it was not a good thing to start life with such a compromise. Nevertheless, I felt considerably relieved, now that this irrevocable decision had been made. Where was the money to come from? My father could raise only part of it. He applied to the University of Basel for a stipend for me, and to my shame it was granted. I was ashamed, not so much because our poverty was laid bare for all the world to see, but because I had secretly been convinced that all the top people, the people who counted, were ill-disposed toward me. I had never expected any such kindness from them. I had obviously profited by the reputation of my father, who was a good and uncomplicated person. Yet I felt myself totally different from him. I had, in fact, two different conceptions of myself. Through number one's eyes, I saw myself as a rather disagreeable and moderately gifted young man with vaulting ambitions, an undisciplined temperament, and dubious manners, alternating between naive enthusiasm and fits of childish disappointment, in his innermost essence a hermit and obscurantist. On the other hand, number two regarded number one as a difficult and thankless moral task, a lesson that had to be got through somehow, complicated by a variety of faults such as spells of laziness, despondency, depression, inept enthusiasm for ideas and things that nobody valued, liable to imaginary friendships, limited, prejudiced, stupid, with a lack of understanding for other people, vague and confused in philosophical matters, neither an honest Christian nor anything else. Number two had no definable character at all. He was a vita per acta, born, living, dead, everything in one, a total vision of life. Though pitilessly clear about himself, he was unable to express himself through the dense, dark medium of number one though he longed to do so. Number two felt that any conceivable expression of himself would be like a stone thrown over the edge of the world, dropping soundlessly into infinite night. But in him light reigned, as in the spacious halls of a royal palace whose high casements open upon a landscape flooded with sunlight. Here were meaning and historical continuity, in strong contrast to the incoherent fortuitousness of Number One's life, which had no real points of contact with its environment. Number Two, on the other hand, felt himself in secret accord with the Middle Ages, as personified by Faust, with the legacy of a past which had obviously stirred Goethe to the depths. For Goethe, too, therefore, and this was my great consolation, Number Two was a reality, Faust was the living equivalent of number two, and I was convinced that he was the answer which Goethe had given to his times. This insight was not only comforting to me, it also gave me an increased feeling of inner security and a sense of belonging to the human community. I was no longer isolated and a mere curiosity, a sport of cruel nature. About this time, I had a dream which both frightened me and encouraged me. It was night in some unknown place, 
and I was making slow and painful headway against a mighty wind. Dense fog was flying along everywhere. I had my hands cupped around a tiny light which threatened to go out at any moment. Everything depended on my keeping this little light alive. Suddenly I had the feeling that something was coming up behind me. I looked back and saw a gigantic black figure following me. But at the same moment I was conscious, in spite of my terror, that I must keep my little light going through the night and wind, regardless of the dangers. When I awoke, I realized at once that the figure was my own shadow on the swirling mists, brought into being by the little light I was carrying. I knew, too, that this little light was my consciousness, the only light I have. My own understanding is the sole treasure I possess, and the greatest. This dream was a great illumination for me. Now I knew that number one was the bearer of the light, and that number two followed him like a shadow. My task was to shield the light and not look back at the Vita Peracta. This was evidently a forbidden realm of light of a different sort. I must go forward against the storm, which sought to thrust me back into the immeasurable darkness of a world where one is aware of nothing except the surfaces of things in the background. The storm pushing against me was time, ceaselessly flowing into the past, which just as ceaselessly dogs our heels. My view of the world spun around another ninety degrees. I recognized clearly that my path led irrevocably outward into the limitations and darkness of three-dimensionality. It seemed to me that Adam must once have left paradise in this manner. Eden had become a spectre for him, and light was where a stony field had to be tilled in the sweat of his brow. At any rate, a schism had taken place between me and number two, with the result that I was assigned to number one and was separated from number two in the same degree, who thereby acquired, as it were, an autonomous personality. I did not connect this with the idea of any definite individuality, although with my rustic origins this possibility would not have seemed strange to me. In the country, people believe in these things according to the circumstances. They are and they are not. The only distinct feature about this spirit was his historical character, his extension in time, or rather, his timelessness. Of course, I did not tell myself this in so many words, nor did I form any conception of his spatial existence. He played the role of a factor in the background of my number one existence, never clearly defined, but yet definitely present. During the years 1892 to 1894, I had a number of rather vehement discussions with my father. My mother avoided everything that might excite him and refused to engage in disputes. I would remain passive during his outbursts of rage, but when he seemed to be in a more accessible mood, I sometimes tried to strike up a conversation with him, hoping to learn something about his inner thoughts and his understanding of himself. It was clear to me that something quite specific was tormenting him, and I suspected that it had to do with his faith. This, it seemed to me, was bound to be the case if the necessary experience had not come to him. From my attempts at discussion, I learned, in fact, that something of the sort was amiss, for all my questions were met with the same old lifeless theological answers, or with a resigned shrug which aroused the spirit of contradiction in me. I could not understand why he did not seize on these opportunities pugnaciously and come to terms with his situation. He had to quarrel with somebody, so he did it with his family and himself. Why didn't he do it with God, the dark author of all created things, who alone was responsible for the sufferings of the world? God would assuredly have sent him by way of an answer one of those magical, infinitely profound dreams which he had sent to me without being asked, and which had sealed my fate. Theology had alienated my father and me from one another. I had a dim premonition that he was inescapably succumbing to his fate. 
He was lonely and had no friend to talk with. At least I knew no one among our acquaintances whom I would have trusted to say the saving word. Once I heard him praying. He struggled desperately to keep his faith. I was shaken and outraged at once, because I saw how hopelessly he was entrapped by the church and its theological thinking. They had blocked all avenues by which he might have reached God directly, and then faithlessly abandoned him. The arch sin of faith, it seemed to me, was that it forestalled experience. His depressive moods increased, and so did his hypochondria. For a number of years he had complained of all sorts of abdominal symptoms, though his doctor had been unable to find anything definite wrong with him. Now he complained of the sensation of having stones in the abdomen. For a long time we did not take this seriously, but at last the doctor became suspicious. Soon afterward his condition deteriorated. In late autumn of 1895 he became bedridden, and early in 1896 he died. I had come home after lectures and asked how he was. Oh, still the same, he's very weak, my mother said. He whispered something to her, which she repeated to me, warning me with her eyes of his delirious condition. He wants to know whether you have passed the state examination. I saw that I must lie. Yes, it went very well. He sighed with relief and closed his eyes. A little later I went in to see him again. He was alone. My mother was doing something in the adjoining room. There was a rattling in his throat, and I could see that he was in the death agony. I stood by his bed, fascinated. I had never seen anyone die before. Suddenly he stopped breathing. I waited, and waited for the next breath. It did not come. Then I remembered my mother and went into the next room, where she sat by the window, knitting. He is dying, I said. She came with me to the bed, and saw that he was dead. She said, as if in wonderment, how quickly it has all passed. The following days were gloomy and painful, and little of them has remained in my memory. Once my mother spoke to me, or to the surrounding air, and remarked, he died in time for you, which appeared to mean you did not understand each other, and he might have become a hindrance to you. The words, for you, hit me terribly hard, and I felt that a bit of the old days had come irrevocably to an end. At the same time, a bit of manliness and freedom awoke in me. After my father's death, I moved into his room and took his place inside the family. For instance, I had to hand out the housekeeping money to my mother every week because she was unable to economize and could not manage money. Six weeks after his death, my father appeared to me in a dream. Suddenly he stood before me and said that he was coming back from his holiday. He had made a good recovery and was now coming home. I thought he would be annoyed with me for having moved into his room, but not a bit of it. Nevertheless, I felt ashamed because I had imagined he was dead. Two days later, the dream was repeated. Later, I kept asking myself, what does it mean that my father returns in dreams, that he seems so real? It was an unforgettable experience, and it forced me for the first time to think about life after death. In 1898, I began to think more seriously about my career as a medical man. I soon came to the conclusion that I would have to specialize. The choice seemed to lie between surgery and internal medicine. Though I had attended psychiatric lectures and clinics, the current instructor in psychiatry was not exactly stimulating, and this was not calculated to prepossess me in favor of psychiatry. In preparing myself for the state examination, therefore, the textbook on psychiatry by Kraft Ebbing was the last I attacked. I expected nothing of it, 
and I still remember that as I opened the book, the thought came to me, well, now let's see what a psychiatrist has to say for himself. By way of excuse for this high and mighty attitude, I must make it clear that in the medical world at that time, psychiatry was quite generally held in contempt. No one really knew anything about it, and there was no psychology which regarded man as a whole and included his pathological variations in the total picture. The director was locked up in the same institution with his patients, and the institution was equally cut off, isolated on the outskirts of the city like an ancient lazaret with its lepers. Beginning with the preface, I read, It is probably due to the peculiarity of the subject and its incomplete state of development that psychiatric textbooks are stamped with a more or less subjective character. A few lines further on, the author called the psychoses diseases of the personality. My heart suddenly began to pound. I had to stand up and draw a deep breath. My excitement was intense, for it had become clear to me in a flash of illumination that for me the only possible goal was psychiatry. Here alone the two currents of my interest could flow together and in a united stream dig their own bed. Here was the empirical field common to biological and spiritual facts, which I had everywhere sought and nowhere found. Here at last was the place where the collision of nature and spirit became a reality. My violent reaction set in when Kraft Ebing spoke of the subjective character of psychiatric textbooks. So I thought the textbook is in part the subjective confession of the author. With his specific prejudice, with the totality of his being, he stands behind the objectivity of his experiences and responds to the disease of the personality with the whole of his own personality. The decision was taken. When I informed my teacher in internal medicine of my intention, I could read in his face his amazement and disappointment. My old wound, the feeling of being an outsider and of alienating others, began to ache again. But now I understood why. No one, not even myself, had ever imagined I could become interested in this obscure bypath. My friends were astounded and put out, thinking me a fool for throwing up the enviable chance of a sensible career in internal medicine, which dangled so temptingly before my nose in favor of this psychiatric nonsense. On December 10th, 1900, I took up my post as assistant at Bergholzli Mental Hospital, Zurich. When I came to that city, I felt the difference at once. Zurich relates to the world not by the intellect, but by commerce. Yet here the air was free, and I had always valued that. Here you were not weighed down by the brown fog of the centuries, even though one missed the rich background of culture.